So we'd like to solve the mystery of why the Euler characteristic is a homotopy invariant of simplicial complexes. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful and intricate developments in a large, uh, large swaths of mathematics. So we will be slow about this. Um, let me show you the sorts of tools that that will be necessary in order to um, get to the bottom of the mystery. So here's an example. Uh, if G is a directed graph. So a directed graph has some set V of vertices again. Um, and E edges uh, with the condition that each edge has a well-defined source vertex U and target vertex V, which means that um, they're not edges are not just undirected pairs U, V in any order. There's a precise order where each edge is going to go from a vertex to the other vertex. Um, the incidence matrix of such a graph is given by um, so you have all the edges here so the columns have edges and the rows have vertices so these are just labeling the I don't know n um, and so the question is what goes here uh, so if you have vertex vi and edge ej then what goes here let's label it with a big fat star so star is minus one if uh, if e has the form vi and then e is going out to something else it's plus one if uh, e is coming into vi and it's zero otherwise so it's just a matrix filled with 0, plus 1, or minus 1. You get a minus 1 if the vertex in the row is the source of the edge in the column. You get a plus 1 if it's the target. And otherwise, if they don't touch at all, then you just get a 0. So a quick, uh, so if G is, I don't know, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 1 to 3, and 4 to 5, six so there are these two pieces um, then the matrix we get for this it's going to take a while to populate but let me tell you some of the entries um, so the edges go on top so what are the edges there's one two one three two three four five and four six um, and the vertices are one two three four five six one two Three, four, five, six. So, for example, in the column for one, three, you get a minus one for the one, which is a source, and a plus one for three, which is the target, and everything else is zero. And then you can fill out the other columns. And here's the fact that's sort of interesting: is that um, the rank of this incidence matrix I is telling us. Um, sort of interesting geometric properties of G, uh, which is to say, if rank of I equals R, then number of components of G is the number of vertices minus R. And the number of loops in G is the number of edges minus R. So that's some interesting um, information sorry number of edges should probably be that e um, so if you look up at the, the the specific g that we have um, it has five vertices and two components so you know once you've filled out uh, all the columns of its incidence matrix and done all the row reduction to figure out its rank um, that you should get five minus two which is three so you know maybe that's something worth checking okay so we want to play the same game of uh, using algebraic objects to determine the properties of simplicial complexes uh, so that go beyond graphs. And in order to do this right, the way we've done with the uh, directed graphs, 
we need a notion for orientation or direction the way we have for edges we have to somehow um, give this plus minus one labeling to all the uh, faces of a given simplex of dimension one less so the way that is accomplished is via um, it's almost an artificial gadget it's uh, it's called an orientation so let's define it so now we've escaped from the world of graphs in that example and are now looking at a simplicial complex an orientation on a simplicial complex k is an injective function which I'll call O. It starts from the vertices of K, which we've called K0 in the past, to uh, the natural numbers. Um, and instead of writing uh, simplices as lists, an oriented simplex is sigma equals V0, V1, blah, 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 VK in K, so that uh, the number you've assigned with O to V0 is strictly less than the number you've assigned to V1, so on up to VK. Now, all this is doing is, instead of letting you write a simplex as an arbitrary sort of a set of vertices with no specific reason that one element of the set should come before the others, it's imposing a sort of strict ordering on all of the vertices of a simplex. And this might seem like, okay, artificial, why do you have to decide which vertex comes before which other vertex? Well, that's exactly like deciding which of the um, vertices of an uh, edge is the source or the target. So this is a structure that's going to help us build matrices whose ranks are going to tell us something important about the simplicial complex. So we should be a little bit patient and, and just keep going. Now, okay. So once you have an orientation, um, you're able to precisely label the, the uh, faces of uh, an oriented simplex. So if sigma is an oriented simplex, which is clearly uh, of dimension k because it has k plus one vertices the way we've written it, then its ith face, um, and now this is what we're defining, and I'm going to write it sort of suggestively as sigma sub minus i. Uh, so this is the oriented simplex um, where you write down all the vertices of our sigma and then discard the ith one. So the things to check are A, this is a k minus one dimensional simplex. Of course it is, it has k vertices in it. And the other thing to check is that this is also oriented. Well, the, we stuck out one of the simplices, but we never changed the orientation uh, imposed order. So this is still an oriented simplex. So this is a well-defined map. Now is where the algebra is just going to sneak into the story and we're never going to get rid of it again. So this is where topology becomes algebraic. It looks like almost nothing is happening, but it's sort of this insidious um, step. Uh, so here is part A, B. Um, the algebraic, so pick, a, pick some place where you have coefficients. So let F be a field. Um, and so typical choices are uh, the field of rational numbers, the field of real numbers, uh, integers modulo uh, prime power. Um, I don't care which one. Just pick your favorite field from uh, abstract algebra. Um, the boundary, the algebraic boundary, of an oriented simplex sigma is, uh, sorry, uh, let's say sigma has dimension k. 
So we'll write this like this. Boundary k sigma is the sum uh, where i goes from 0 to k. Remember, k little k is a dimension of sigma. Uh, of minus 1 to the i, uh, sigma minus i. Okay, if you've never seen this before, this might seem like an absolutely bizarre uh, construction. So the first thing to figure out is what this minus 1 means. So this 1 is the multiplicative identity. of f. So what we've done is that we've taken a k-dimensional simplex and spit out a plus minus one combination of all of its faces of dimension one less. Um, if you'd like to see examples of, um, of this, I mean we'd have to fix an orientation, but let's assume for the purposes of being uh, coherent that um, the orientation is based on vertex labels. So uh, let me give you an example, or two. So if you have the solid one simplex, um, then the boundary, then the algebraic boundary of the top cell 0, 1 uh, assuming the orientation 0 is less than 1, is going to give you, uh, let's see, uh, the first thing you have to do is minus 1 to the 0, which is plus 1, sigma sub minus 0. So this is 1 minus 0. And, and, and I really want you to remember that this is not the number 1 minus the number 0. It's the vertex 1 minus the vertex 0. This is an edge. Um, if you tried the same thing with the solid 2 simplex, so this, but it's all shaded in, Let's give everything a label. So this is 0, 1, 2. Then its boundary of this whole thing, 0, 1, 2, that, that two-dimensional simplex, the unique two-dimensional simplex here, is uh, if you follow the formula, it's going to be um, 0, 1, plus 1, 2, minus 0, 2. And one way to see this is to draw orientations on the edges the way you would for a graph. So 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 0 to 2, and then uh, look at things counterclockwise inside. So draw a counterclockwise loop. And now any time uh, the direction uh, on the edge agrees with the direction on the loop, you get a plus 1. So plus it agrees, plus it agrees. And now when you come to 0, 2, the, the loop is going up, but the edge is coming down, so it's a minus sign. Um, so you can um, uh, write what the boundary will be based on this uh, for at least two dimensional simplices. This works out pretty well. So this is going to be a plus sign in front of 0, 1, a minus sign in front of 0, 2. Oops, that's not the way 0, 2 goes. And another plus sign in front of 1, 2. Okay, and so on. So you can take any. Um, any uh, oriented simplex and pass to its um, boundary. Now here's the proposition. Um, and in order to state it formally, we'd need the structure of vector spaces and so on, but I absolutely want to wait for that for a second. Um, the proposition is for any oriented simplex sigma, we have, um, and let's say this is an oriented k-dimensional simplex, so we keep track of its dimension. Um, its boundary, algebraic boundary as defined uh, upstairs, uh, this is going to be some list of lower dimensional simplices, and you can just linearly define the boundary of those as well. This is always equal to zero. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, the proof of this has been assigned as an exercise, but I want to show you what happens for the case that we've drawn here. So for dimension uh, sigma, which is k to be 2, uh, we could calculate this. So let's say sigma is exactly as before, v0, v1, 
v2 uh, ordered v0 less than v1 less than v2. So uh, del 2 of sigma is going to be as we computed upstairs uh, v0 v1 minus v0 v2 plus uh, v1 v2. And now if you want del 1 of del 2 of sigma, you need um, to take the boundary of the edge v0 v1, which is v1 minus v0, similarly v2 minus v0, and now v2 minus v1. And now you check every vertex cancels. Um, so there's a there's a v1 with a plus sign over here, and it's going to cancel with the v1 uh, with a minus sign over there. And similarly, there are two copies of v0, two copies of v2. And this is the reason it's so important to have an orientation with minus signs. Um, if you didn't have minus signs, then this cancellation would not occur. Um, we've done something slightly sneaky here. What I've done here that's sneaky is I've just assumed that this del1 is a linear operator, this first boundary. Uh, we had a formal sum of uh, one-dimensional simplices, and I just applied it to each of the pieces and added them up. So I'm, I'm sort of secretly inherently treating these as linear maps. So let's make this sort of formal instead of just having these um, sneaky linear maps floating around. So here's the um, here's one of the main definitions or, or uh, propositions, let's say. Um, let K be a simplicial complex, and we'll assume it's oriented so that we can make sense of uh, i face of every simplex and therefore the algebraic boundary of every simplex. For each dimension, k bigger than zero, define uh, two things. The first one is ck of k, which is all f linear combinations of k simplices in k. And the other thing to define is del k, and here's little k down here. So the up, the big k is always a simplicial complex, and the little k is always a dimension. Uh, and this goes from c k to c k minus one. Um, so this is called the chain group, the kth chain group, and this is called the kth boundary map. So the k chain group is a vector space over f uh, where the bases are the k-dimensional simplices. This is exactly the way we had edges being uh, and vertices being bases uh, in the case of an uh, incidence matrix of a graph. And then this boundary map is exactly the algebraic boundary that we've computed upstairs. So this is the f linear map defined by the action where every simplex is sent to its algebraic boundary. And now you realize that this algebraic boundary that we had defined upstairs, where is it? Here it is. Um, this is always a linear combination with f coefficients of simplicity. So it's definitely a linear combination of basis elements of ck minus 1. And so we've got a recipe for taking each basis element of ck and spitting out um, this linear combination of uh, so a basis element of ck minus 1. So therefore, this forms a linear map. Um, and the magic property is, uh, based on the previous uh, proposition, is that any time you take del k and del k minus 1, this is always going to be the zero map from C k to C k minus 2. 
Okay. Um, good. Now this k to k minus 2 might start bothering you. It does bother me a little bit. So what we're going to do is make it nice and symmetric around k. So this can be just re-indexed so that this is k plus 1. And instead of k minus 1 over there, that's k. And now what's nice is that this map is going to go instead of from k to k minus 2, it's going to go from k plus 1 to k minus 1. And that sort of uh, uh, makes everyone feel better about symmetry around k. Okay, um, there's an equivalent way of saying this um, del k composed with del k plus 1 gives you 0, um, which is to say uh, that the kernel of del k k contains the image of del k plus 1. There's no difference between those two uh, statements. Okay, and now we can end this lecture with the main definition. This is what we've been leading up to. Um, we started with a simplicial complex. We imposed an orientation. We just used that orientation to assign plus and minus labels to faces of every given simplex. And then we checked with a calculation that when you composed boundary of boundary, you always get zero. So this is the main definition of this lecture. This is where we want it to end up. A chain complex over the field F is a pair. I'll call it C bullet, D bullet, and the bullets are just indices of vector spaces, F vector spaces, uh, CK uh, for K bigger than or equal to zero, and maps, linear maps, uh, DK going from CK to one degree lower, CK minus one. Uh, so if you take all of this information, it fits into a nice ordered sequence where you have C0, C1, C2, and so on, uh, and you by convention add zero there. So the linear maps are, this is D0, D1, D2, D3, and so on. And you go all the way up if you like. Um, satisfying. DK plus one, dk, that composite 0 for all k. So we are able to produce this purely algebraic object. It's just a whole bunch of matrices um, connecting uh, linear spaces, uh, sorry, vector spaces. And we're able to construct this for any simplicial complex. And in the next lecture, we will study properties of these chain complexes in order to understand what they know about the simplicial complex.